Thank you for taking the time to listen to Pastor Eddie's Bible study. Due to the nature of the discussion, he would ask that you would listen to all his answers and responses to each statement and question that has been asked. Ah, uh, come on now. Good evening, everyone. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that are gathered here tonight. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of hearing of this storm uh, out in the Gulf, and we don't know exactly what, what it's gonna, where it's going to hit exactly in the landfall, but we know you'll protect us. We know you'll take care of us. We've been there many times before. We just ask that you, uh, wherever it hits, that you would just take care of all the folks on the shoreline especially. And Lord, that you would just bless, guide, lead, and direct We continue to lift up uh, Louisiana and the flooding that they have experienced. Lord, please wrap your loving arms around them. Take care of them. Minister to them as only you can. Thank you for the wonderful, um, miraculous statement that Georgia gave to us about the little one that we've been praying for, up to uh, above five pounds. We praise the Lord, believing continually that she's going to get better and better and better. We're just going to believe that, Lord. Father, I thank you for the gentleman at Shans and how he's doing so much better compared to when we prayed for him Sunday, how Carolyn is doing so much better at the rehab, and Lord, uh, the way that the office is pulled together to help each other out, we just give you praise, and we're so thankful to have Seth with us at this time as well. Father, we just pray for Brad as he uh, is to have his procedure this Thursday, and for Bill Lyon as he continues to recover. And for all the folks that have been gone through the summer months, slowly coming back in, I know some folks are here, haven't been here in a while, that are here tonight. And Father, whether we should hold our services tomorrow night, we just ask that uh, by in the morning we'll know and be able to get the word out. So please give us wisdom, guidance, and direction as only you can. Father, we love you so very much. Thank you again for all that you give to us. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And may all of God's people say... Amen and amen. Now, we're going to use the same handouts tonight that we used um, uh, last week. So if you were not here or you did not bring yours, we've got about 25 extras. And uh, we're going to recap uh, to begin with, uh, mainly because I talked to Rochelle and we had some difficulties um, taping the Bible study last week. And so, therefore, we ended up, we were going to miss like 20, 25 minutes of the Bible study. So we ended up just not putting it on uh, the webpage. For those of you that follow it, and you may have wondered why. And so I told Rochelle what we would do is we'll open up and recap uh, just for a few moments what we discussed last week and then continue tonight our conversational style like we did last week. You remember some Tuesday nights we do more of a lecture Uh, in the lesson and then other times we just share a little bit and then pass the microphone around and try to play off the concept that we're sharing questions that are being raised so uh, saying that remember again that if you get the microphone put it on your chin they'll regulate the sound so that everybody can hear and it'll go on the web Uh, you will go on the web so just so you're you're aware of that and I may have the uh, tendency to say your name. I, I do that sometimes without thinking about it, you know, when you have the microphone, so your name would be on the web. Um, and we have been getting, you know, like uh, between Sundays and Wednesdays, sometimes 20, 30, 40 hits, people going on listening to these studies and these messages. So there are a number of folks that are connecting with us through that. And uh, so it's a great opportunity. We're going to begin with Acts chapter 9 again. Now, I'm not going to read the first 16 verses as we did last week, but I do want to kind of just recap. If you'll look at the questions again uh, there in uh, verse 3 of of verses 1 through 9, when did we see Jesus before in a bright light? Remember in the passage, the first nine verses, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who's persecuting the Christians, is blinded by an amazing light, knocked off his horse. A voice from heaven said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And we lifted up in our discussion his question of, who art thou, Lord? You know, trying to understand if this was God knocking him off the horse, you know, why, why would uh, uh, God say that you're persecuting me? He never had the concept that God was being persecuted by him. He thought he was doing God's will. And so we had a great discussion about his misunderstanding and how that sometimes God has to knock us off our horse our situations in life. Sometimes problems and struggles, you know, are actually good things because they draw us to our knees. 
And so he is blinded, uh, and in that process um, is when he experiences the Lord. And we lifted up the number three. Remember, he was blind for three days, and how that the number three is used throughout the Scriptures in various ways, certain sacred numbers. And we discussed that a little bit last week as well, three and seven and twelve and forty. Those are all key numbers in the Bible. Uh, when you get to verses 10 through 16, God uh, speaks to Ananias to go to Saul to pray for him so that he might be healed. And uh, God seems to always use humans to minister to other humans. And that was part of our discussion last week as well. Ananias argued a little bit with God. We raised the question, is it okay to argue with God? And uh, a number of folks shared about that last week and talked about how that when they've been through certain difficulties, one lady shared uh, some that when she went through difficulties, she could, she could question God and God was still with her. And we lifted up uh, that particular individual, a lot of the loss that she has experienced in our church, losing a number of loved ones, um, children, grandchildren, and how that she was able to even question God even though you know, she didn't understand what was taking place, but she was able to, to work through her struggle and God was still with her. And that was a beautiful testimony that was given last week. Again, if you were here, I won't mention the individual's name, but I thought that was beautiful that she shared that. Then we got to the meat and potatoes of the discussion last week. This is where we ended when it, the uh, idea that God chose Saul, knocked him off his horse, we talked about predestination, which is a concept that comes from John Calvin in the 1500s and that uh, the Reformed Church, mainly for our understanding, the Presbyterian Church, holds to that theological philosophy that things are set and that God is, you know, He has chosen certain things, which means He has not chosen certain things. We talked about the difference last week, comparing and contrasting that with John Wesley's view who he held to a gentleman that came about a hundred years after John Calvin. His name was Arminius, who felt that we had free will. And so you had those two different topics. Was everything chosen by God, or does mankind have free will? And the way we ended it last week, and then we'll open that back up for discussion in a moment, is that maybe it's a combination. Because it appears that, that Saul didn't have a choice. He's knocked off the horse, you know, and now he could lay in flat on his back, just say, I'm not going to pay attention to this. But I wonder if there's not times that, that God knows our breaking point and he can push those buttons. And even though we can say that we have free will to choose or not choose, if enough buttons are pushed, <laughs> chances are you're going to make certain choices. You know, so maybe it is a combination, and I'm pulling that, Brother Steve, I don't see him here tonight, but Steve, is he here? I don't see him. If he was here, he maybe got resurrected and he's in heaven and the rest of us are left behind, you know, that's okay, friend. Well, Steve wrote me a, a text um, or an email about that because his background, as you know, was Reformed theology, which is that concept of things being set. And he believes kind of like, it's the same as I do that there's a combination. I believe in my heart, and this is where I want to start a discussion tonight, that, that it is a mixture. I do believe that as well. And I think that God pushed the buttons on Saul because he was the perfect man to get Christianity on the move. He was an intellectual. He was a leader in the Jewish uh, uh, Pharisees. Um, he was so strong doing what he thought was right. If God could get him turned around, man, he would be the man to get things going for Christianity. And as we said before, he authored most of the New Testament. And even though we're followers of Jesus, our understanding of what Jesus taught us in the Gospels is revealed to us in Saul's letters to the early Christians. And remember, his name was changed. He began to go by his Greek name, Paul, because he felt that God had called him to minister to those outside the Jewish faith. The disciples ended up ministering to those within the Jewish faith, Peter and James and even John to some degree. 
So we left it with that. A lot of hands were going up, and I don't know if you'll remember uh, your questions or your thoughts, but we can at least see if there's any here. Uh, but I do believe that, go ahead, Fran, um, if you have a question, I do believe that it's a mixture. I have no problem with God pushing the buttons on some people so that a zillion other people have free will to choose because that person may not have had a choice. I mean, in my, my view. Yes, ma'am. Dot? Because my mind goes in strange directions. Be, because we were talking about Saul and predestination, and um, of course you and I have had a discussion about preordination right. yes. too. Um, it got me to wondering, Jesus was human, totally. Mm -hmm. Did he have free choice? Could he have said no? I mean, it caused me to think about those questions as well. That's a great question. I actually did years ago a sermon on that question. Forgotten all about it till you just said that, Dot. And I remember preaching saying, I believe that Jesus could have said no, could have partnered with the devil, and what a force that would have been against the Father. I said, I, so therefore, him dying on the cross, I mean, God's taken this incredible chance by giving a part of himself that could choose, I'm not going to do this. If that's true, I forgot all about that, Dot, that's so cool. If that's true, then free will champions because God offers free will and does not force even his son to do what he wants him to do, right? Hold it right to the chin. You got to go back to the the night before right. the crucifixion. He was up there. He was praying. He said, "I'm gonna pray." Mm -hmm. And so he went by himself to pray. And he asked him three times. He prayed, went to the disciples three times because he was sleeping. But he came back and he had he asked him again. Yes. Is there any way to take this from me? Yes. This would be the only time he'd ever been separated from God. Exactly. The only thing worse, that, that's the worst thing you could ever do to him. The, the, the cross was a simple matter, but being separated, separated. Was, the, was the thing he could not, not cope with. Yes. I heard Charles Stanley preach on that uh, one time, Ray, and he said that I really think that's what Jesus meant when he said, take, uh, you know, is there any other way except this cup? that the cup was not the cross. He knew he was going to the cross, according to Mr. Stanley. He said, what I think it was is the separation. And he said, so symbolically, when he's separated, he said, that to me is the imagery of the darkness of the cross, because the darkness of, you know, that God pulls away, you know, because it's, he's separated because he becomes sin, and the, the theological concept that God does not look on sin, I mean, figuratively speaking. I, I love that idea. I just hadn't thought about it till I heard Stanley say that, and you to lift that up. Who else has the mic, and then we'll come to Bev? Barbara? I like thinking about it as divine providence. Oh, okay. Because okay. with divine providence, uh, there is, as you have expressed beautifully, the wide range of freedom of choice. Right. There's right. so much more that can come in there, and that is that the God, the sovereign, with all that authority, he, if somebody's not going to do it, mm -hmm. he has so many other options of yes. others that he can use. Yes. But what we've seen throughout the Old Testament is when God makes up his mind, the individual that he will use, he will go after that yes. person. Yes, yes, very much. Beverly up here, Fran. Mm -hmm. Steve, I saw you come in. I've already used your, uh, your email you sent to me. I, I've been, I love the idea that you talked about, and I don't know if you remember or not, breaking points in your uh, person's life that God knows where those buttons are that Barbara's referring to to push, where the choice is made you know, when you're falling flat on your back, you know, he knows our breaking point. But if that emphasizes to everybody else the opportunity for free will, there is a combination, like you said in your article. And I agree with that wholeheartedly, that it's, it's not one or the other, it's both. And, and it's the mystery that we don't understand completely. Beverly. Well, we had a big discussion about that in the disciple class uh -huh. that we took. And it only makes sense if 
Christ could not have sinned, then how could he be our example? Because it wouldn't have been a temptation if he would True. not have had the ability to, to True. sin. And remember, there were and he those... was tested in all points, like as we are, but yet without sin. Right. So as our example, he wouldn't really be a good example if he could not have sinned. If he really sinned. couldn't have sinned. That's so. a good point, Bev. And, I, you know, there were movements in the early church age that tried to, to try to pull apart some of those concepts. The idea that he was just gave the image that he could, he could, you know, like he was a human and he really wasn't human because he's God. That separation of the divine and the, uh, uh, the, exactly, exactly. Gnosticism was such a movement at that time. And there's so many different belief systems, but we truly believe that he could have went the other direction. Yes, coach. You know, if, if you believe that God and Jesus is one, mm-hmm. I don't see how you could say he had a choice in it. Mm-hmm. That, you know, this was kind of set. Right. And, it, and, and, of course, Jesus was predicted many times long before he came on the scene. Exactly. And yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It, that there's that oneness, you know. But in a way, I mean, just the, the picture that God gives us, John, of the Trinity, just the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, the idea that I have two sons and they are a part of me, and yet now they're, they're not. And so they have free will and, you know, uh, they're, they're different. They're, they're their own individuals, you know. But they're still, they're, they're my sons. You know, they're a part of me. They look like me. They, they uh, you know, they have, they have certain of, of my characteristics, even if they do not claim it being from me, you know. <laughs> Hope if One thing good, the baldness comes on, the, I understand, the mother's side. So they both have still a head of hair. I already was going bald when I was their age, both of them. But, I mean, I th- that's the way I look at it. I really think that Jesus had more of a choice than we can realize, I think. I mean, I may be all wrong, but I, that may well be. Brad and, and Ray up here. Fran, and then, oh, and then uh, Gretchen. Let's get two over here and here, and then we're going to start in verse 16, chapter 9, and continue right over this way, uh, Brad, Brad, and then uh, Ray, Ray, and then Gretchen, and then we're going to start with verse 16. Go ahead, Brad. The part that stands out for me is that Jesus knew that he was going through that pain, Mm -hmm. and he told everybody, two or three years ahead of time. So he had made the decision himself a long time in advance. Right. So when he got to that point where he knew the pain was going to come on and hurt and hurt Mm -hmm. and hurt, I think it's like anybody else. You say, boy, I don't know whether I want to do this or not. Because he was all human as well. That's That's a good point, Brad. That kind of goes back to what John is saying. That really, it, the, the choice of that concept, John, he's saying is that the pain, the humanness was coming out in that prayer instead of the spiritual separation. That's, that's as valid as the other. Very much. Ray? Uh, You've got to understand, too, that when the, the decision he was making when he did that, he, was, he had a new body. It, as John was talking about, the, the separation between him being one Hold and God. Hold the mic up. One. One and uh, one is as one, right? But now he sits at the right hand of God because he has a new body. A new resurrected he's, he's body. He's a new resurrected for that reason. He knew that to be what he didn't want to be was to have to, to go through the pain that, of being away from him and put into the into the dark place. For that's two. that's valid. That's valid too. I I they're both valid. I don't know. I think it, again, it's probably not. It's not either or. It's probably and. You know, I think there's a lot of the mystery um, of this concept here that is just beyond us. I think the cross it meant far more than we can ever imagine. Even the Isaiah's prophecy that by his stripes we are healed. And that, that passage was used when uh, Peter's mother-in-law was healed. They used that passage out of Isaiah the reference in Matthew, that's, it's fascinating. There's so much to the cross, to the punishment, beyond just even the forgiveness of our sins. I, there's just, it's amazing. Amen? Amazing. <laughs> Go ahead, Gretchen. Okay. <clears throat> when we started talking like this, I remember the night Jesus sent his disciples ahead of him, mm-hmm. and he went to pray. And I think that he... W- intended to do it, but he wanted 
the strength and the will he wanted to really uh, give yes. himself into doing it. Exactly. And exactly. he needed that prayer. Right. Right. I guess uh, I remember when we were in, when I was in seminary, I remember the debates and the discussion, which I thought was fantastic. We're going to pick up now in verse 16, chapter 9, if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles ready. I remember the, the concept there of talking about Jesus and where he was in his decisions and, and the idea that even the, uh, uh, the creeds that were written, trying to understand that he's all God. Remember the Nicene Creed? He's all God and he's also all man at the same time. Beyond anything we can comprehend, but he is. So the temptations that he faces are in the human nature, but also there are the spiritual sensations that were probably going on that we just cannot even fathom. Let's pick up with verse 16 and read just a little bit here in Acts chapter 9 to continue uh, the lesson. Um, Let's see here. No, verse 17, I'm sorry. Start with verse 17 of chapter 9. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Remember when he argued with God? He placed his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is going to open up a whole new discussion. Um, Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Let's go ahead and read on and then we'll back up to these passages. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc? In Jerusalem, among those who call on this name, and hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Look at that. That's the way the NIV explains it. Proving. Remember again what a powerful man this was, you know, in a a variety of ways. Let's go ahead and read, um, let's read the rest of his till we get to Peter. Let's read verse 23 down to 31, then we'll discuss that, and then we'll, if we have time, we'll go into Peter. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Verse 24, day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night, lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. That's one of the questions on your handout. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple, kind of like Ananias. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Verse 29, he talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. Now, you could take that to mean getting Saul out of there. (laughs) They had a time of peace, but I don't think that's at all what was being mentioned. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. That's where the peace comes in, obviously. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. The Word of God for the people of God. Now, let me just look at your handout, if you will, for a moment, and just let's work through these questions, and then it'll bring up a lot of the different things that would probably be interesting to be discussed. So let's just follow the the, the questions, if you will. Um, Why do you think it was so graphic? Anybody have an idea? Fish, I'd say fish scale, scales falling from his eyes. I mean, why, why is it, why not just pray for him and he can see? I mean, what, there has to be some kind of symbolism Something going on with scales falling from his eyes, don't you think? Or that wouldn't be in the scriptures, you know? Why so graphic? Any idea? Honestly, don't know. I'm just, I'm raising that as a question. Anybody have any thoughts about why the scales might be there? 
Yes, Maggie, hold on for a minute. Let her get the microphone over there so everybody can hear. Scales. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of fish. I do with too. Scales. Yes. So does yes. that have something to do? I mean, all through the thing, you know, fishermen. Fishermen, yeah, yeah the good fish. point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, the scales that, of a fish. Yeah, and fallen. Exactly. I mean, when you use the word scales, it has, that's the only thing. That's I a good think. point. I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. That's good. I like that, Maggie. Like that. Here, uh, right up here, Monty at the very front. Fran, make you run. <laughs> yes, what's your thoughts, Monty? Well, the scales are so opaque, uh, you couldn't see through them. Exactly. And, you know, so and so maybe the blinders that were, maybe it's symbolical of the blinders of the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. that he could not see God. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? Oh, in the back. Holly? Well, all along, Jesus was a fisherman of men, yes. and all of his uh, disciples were fishermen of men. So the scales, to me, represent being a fisher of, of men. Man. Okay, good. That's kind of what ties with Maggie. I never thought about it that way. I like that. I like that. Yes. All right to Adele. Well, and another thing, it's more dramatic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think, okay, all of a sudden I can see, okay, no big deal. I, you know, I just had something in my eye or I wasn't. But if you see things falling out of your eyes and then you can see, exactly. I think that's a little more dramatic. I, I like that. I like that. Now, let me tie in with that. He's baptized right away. Now, if I was the preacher in town, you know, I don't like it, but I, it's in the scriptures, but I don't like to baptize people right away. You know, because so many people just have an emotional experience. And maybe, maybe scripturally, baptism is for an emotional experience. I mean, think about what we read a couple of weeks back, the Ethiopian. You remember with the deacon, Philip, and how as they came along when he found the Lord sharing with the uh, Philip, they passed by some water and he said, what's to keep me from being baptized? He said, nothing. He baptizes him. The baptism, again, is the sign of, of entering into a new life. You know, uh, there's no doubt about that. But I know, as well as you do, so many times people have an emotional experience, but it's not going to stick with them very much. It's kind of like Jesus, the sower, sower in the seed. So he immediately is baptized into this new faith. Now that seems to have convinced Barnabas, you know, maybe he, Barnabas had some connection with him earlier on, you know, but the other disciples, they're just, they don't believe it, you know. And I don't think I would either, you know. I, uh, when I hear all, you know, the, our two candidates running for president, and when they both start stressing Christianity after they've shared some other thoughts, I just kind of, you know, I just, uh, you know, and I'll just leave it at that. I just, I just, I, I've become more and more a, a, a skeptic as the older I get, you know. And when somebody wants to be baptized, I want to make sure that they know what they're doing and that they have ex not just experienced emotionally, but mentally, you know, theologically and just, and, uh, you know, but according to the scriptures, that seems to happen just right away. When at Pentecost, they're baptized right away. They're brought in. So maybe I'm looking at it wrong, you know? I don't know. Anybody got a thought on that? Yes. Brad? Oh, right here. I'm sorry. I didn't see. Yeah, Jerry? Could I go back to the scales again? Yes, you can. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. Could it have removed the mystery if he had just suddenly been able to see? Hmm. But seeing those scales and feeling them and then having them removed, you'd certainly remember it. Exactly. Longer. And maybe that was more for him, that he realized that this, that I have had something blocking me from seeing the truth. Just like when he said, who art thou, Lord? That's a good point. I like that. Brad? When the scales fell off, the Holy Spirit entered. Yes, that's a good and point. And the Holy Spirit, no reason why he can't be baptized when the Holy Spirit's there. That's a good point. That's a good point. Now, a sign of the Holy Spirit, you know, that's one of the questions there um, in that process. Um, when being baptized, that's mm -hmm. a commitment to, to God. Yes. And if he can finally see uh that's a pretty dramatic thing. True. And rather than just hurry up and baptize me, I think it was at that point he decided to make his life a commitment to 
Christ and God. Okay, okay. Well, then what y'all were saying answers uh, verse 20. It says, I asked, is that good? And you're obviously saying that is good because he's made his commitment. He needed that seal. Baptism was his seal, just like the, the scales falling off. Lorna? Well, already he was not believed when he wanted to be baptized. People didn't, right. de- didn't believe him. The other disciples were afraid of him. They didn't want to see anything of okay. him. right. So wasn't the fact that he had scales, something actually physical falling from an eye, his eyes, make it more believable? Probably How, so. You could lie about being blind True. With, without an evidence of something, and so the scales falling from exactly. his eyes. Exactly, and when, and when Ananias says, I saw that too, you know, I mean, Ananias is the proof as well. Right. You know, that's a good point. It's and, valid. And something then baptism is, is, is a public demonstration of a very private faith. That's true. And again, that goes back to this proving thing. He had to do things to prove his, his um, sincerity and exactly. the fact that he was called. So baptism can very well be the outward sign for the reason of the church community, more than just for himself, because it was proof. Honestly, he could not preach without being baptized, because if he's going to start that would be the question. Have you been baptized? Well, no, I'm thinking about it. Well, then shut up. <laughs> You're right. That's a good point. Who has the Lloyd? Uh, well, I, I, I hate to enter this in, but we're looking at different versions. Yes. For example, in the New Jerusalem Bible, which I'm using, it says it was as though scales, scales. fell away from Saul's eyes. Right. It doesn't say it was scales. It was as though scales. As though scales. That's it. Uh, goodness gracious. I don't. I'll tell you what. Now, I, I'm going to go on my professor, uh, that I, my Greek professor in seminary. He said that this version right here, your pew Bibles, was the closest in the New Testament to the original Greek. Let's turn in the red Bibles and see what it says. That's a good point. I'm not even sure what it says there. And again, I'm just calling on uh, Bob Lyon in heaven. That's what he said, so I'm just going to believe what he said. What verse would that be now? I'm trying to look. 22? 18? And immediately, something like scales is what it says. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. So according to the, uh, this Bible, the Revised Standard Version, gives the idea that something... But maybe it wasn't a fish scale as we lifted up, but it was something that somebody said, oh, that looks like a fish scale, but it was not. But it looked like some kind of scale. It gives the idea that something literally fell from his eyes. Interesting, interesting. You got Coach? Oh, Ray, I'm sorry. I didn't see the mic. When and then coach. Ananias touched him and, and the scales fell off, he says that the Holy Spirit came upon him. Yes. If the Holy Spirit come upon him, it came through Ananias into him. He Please. knew he was ready to be baptized. Oh. There was no question about it when he, the Holy Spirit, that's like the, when Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit went, up, went upon everybody and touched their lips, they went outside and started talking. They okay. Was, they was baptized in the Spirit gotcha. as well as the water. Okay. So, yes, I see what you're saying. Coach in the back, a couple folks in the very back. Eddie, what, what difference does it make if it was scales or mud and spit? <laughs> I'm just wondering, I'm always dissecting the scriptures, John, and I'm wondering why I think everything has a purpose. I I see the Bible full of clues for us to live our life today. So I think when something specific like that is in there, that it's not there just because the author was like, oh, I wonder how I could describe this. Well, I'll just put scales. I think it means something. And so when I'm studying the scriptures and asking God, you know, if Florida State's going to beat the Gators, Lord, is that going to happen? Is that going to happen? And I said, I just don't believe it. And he said, son, let me let, let the fish scales fall from your eyes. You know, I just, you see what I'm saying? I just, I think those things are important, but I'm not sure exactly why. That's my belief system. Or they wouldn't be there, or they wouldn't be there is what Bev is saying. Well, I know what, I, I know I what you're saying there, is that... Did, on all the miracles and stuff, he, he let something happen. He just, like everybody's saying, he just didn't heal him. He could have just let him go right, but, side but, return, but he doesn't ever do that. He does something so that the people can see... Exactly. Happened. But now, see, the thing is, and I, to me it's important. I, I see what you're saying, but to me, just like... Uh, when we're not going to have time tonight, but when we get to the end of this chapter where Peter 
And it's an incredible process. It's, It's a liturgical process of Peter healing this woman. And in that process of doing that, Peter, uh, before that, heals this other man. If you remember the first healing Peter did, he said, silver and gold, I do not have but what I have. And he took him by the hand in the name of, you know, Jesus Christ. But in this next healing that's in the bottom of this uh, uh, chapter, he just speaks the healing. He doesn't reach down and touch the man's hands. And that's on your handout. So I'm wondering why the guy stood up. I understand why the guy in Acts 3 or in Acts 4, whichever one it is, stood up. But in this one, I'm not sure. You know, and I'm not, but I think there's a reason for that. So when there's something like that that's different, I think there's a reason. And I think God wants to say something to Eddie that may help me deal with some other issue if I will seek the scriptures. You know, so I think that these kind of things are important for some reason. I'm just not sure. That's a good, uh, very valid question. I can't hear you, guy. What happened to my, oh, there it is. Yes, sir. He probably said, Eddie, what does it matter? What what would now? What does it matter? On what does it matter oh. on the Florida State? <laughs> on the Florida State, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't pick on you, Gator. Shouldn't pick on you, Gator. The yes, yeah. It's me. Uh, Grace. There you are, Grace. And then I see I saw Steve's hand too. Go ahead, Grace. I was wondering, you know, the uh, fish is a Christian symbol. Exactly. And uh, days when the Christians were really persecuted and you met someone walking, one would draw half, and the other one would draw the other exactly. half. Exactly, I've heard phrases like that. And you would like know that. that you're meeting a Christian. Yeah, during the years of persecution, yeah. Could this be proof to the uh, other people that Saul is finally a Christian and that they should listen to him? Um, you know, maybe so. I, I just think there's more involved with the scales uh, when it's he, a physical that right they when can Luke see. is writing that yeah when Luke is writing that I think he's trying to you know he's making a point and of course that's copied over the years by different traditions you know I think it means and it may very well mean the idea of Christianity I don't know I think that's excellent well I, I just mean, never that, thought about it that way never mm-hmm. thought about it that way go ahead Grace are you finished well I was going to say that uh, they needed proof they did that he is a Christian yeah. physical proof is what right, I'm saying, right. and, and they that saw was, that. I mean, that's a good, yeah. I, I'm asking, could this be? I, it, I'm I'm open to anything. I just because I think there's something important here, but I don't know what it might be. I, and maybe we are pulling uh, too many uh, pins out of the haystack, Coach. I don't <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. Well, many people have lost their eyesight on a temporary basis mm-hmm. and had it restored. And I think this was. God's way of saying, uh, you didn't get your sight back. This was not a natural occurrence. Not natural. That's it a good way to look It was not a at natural it. occurrence. This mm-hmm. was a supernatural healing. Mm-hmm. And it was God who removed the impediment of blindness. Exactly. And that impediment never would have been removed had Saul not repented. Exactly. And so God is basically pushing him to the wall, so mm-hmm. to speak, and saying, you need to repent of your ways. Exactly. And I and find it interesting. That was, excuse me, just hold up, Steve, just a minute. Maybe that was part of the three-day experience, the conversion, and maybe that his coming to an understanding, the powerful movement that must have been, uh, and then that to fall, to understand that Ananias is coming, all of that together, the perfect storm, you know? I mean, that just seems like that's the idea of the supernatural event. It would take that to push him to the wall, I would think. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just trying to put that together in my head. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And then the uh, baptism, when Paul expands on the event over in chapter 22, uh, verse 16, it was Ananias who said to him, and now why are you waiting? So evidently Paul ah. was you know, sitting there like, Excellent. okay, I mean, if you just had your eyes opened up, if you've been blind for three days, you'd be like, okay, exactly. now what? Yes. And then, then Ananias goes on to say, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Amen. So he urged him to be Thank baptized. Thank you. Well, that's and, tying in, yes, tying in the, the reasoning that was put behind it, that it came from Ananias, speaking boldly. It's, it seems to be, it's interesting that in the, after the apostolic age, you know, the church put people through the paces, you know, they had to be catecumens and yes. wait a long time to get baptized. To be baptized. And, you know, That's that what doesn't we do. seem to be what the apostles did. It no. was easy in. Exactly. You know? And I, then they instructed them, you know, Jesus says, 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then teaching them, that's yes. the next step, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever that's I commanded you. That's a good point, you. exactly. We may have it all wrong then. See, that's what I was saying earlier, that that's just not what I do. I want to make sure the person's ready, and according to the scriptures, they're baptized right up front, you know? And that's their seal. Do you remember, too, uh, tie this in, if you don't mind, John Wesley in his first society meetings, you know, the people to become card-carrying uh, members, they received an actual card. And on the card, my understanding is that it just said the simple words, do you want to flee the wrath to come? And if it's yes, indeed, well, then come on in. That was the concept of the card, at least what the card meant. And so maybe the baptism, again, the outward sign of the inward grace of God is just get it going. Jump start. Get it going. You know? Go ahead, Brad. If you remember, those people ate fish on a daily basis mm -hmm. if they could get their hands on them. Okay. And they knew what the size of scales were because they had cleaned many of them off of fish. So I think it gives them a reference to the size of the shield that fell away from his eyes. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, very much. Else? All right. Lloyd in the back there. I want to talk a little bit about emotion. Okay. Uh, I've, al I've always had problem with this because... Um, Having emotions? I'm sorry, Lloyd. <laughs> Y'all don't know he's a retired lawyer and they have no emotions. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. In, in going through my life, uh -huh. um, I've had my most memorable experiences, uh, I think, in my walk, uh, have been somewhat emotional mm. and I've, I've always wrestled with the idea it, it, it kind of repels me a little bit to think that I have to reason mm. something when emotion is the strongest thing you have on your in you and the strongest emotion well I won't say the strongest positive emotion is love. Yes. And that is an emotion. There, yes. There's is, and my my relationship has developed through a number of these emotional uh, incidents. Experiences. Yes. Let me go with that, Lloyd. Again, just to remind everyone, you remember that in Methodism we follow the quadrilateral. You remember, and how we've used the points of the cross and how from the Anglican Church, you know, Mr. Wesley always taught about tradition and reason and scripture, you know, the three basic principles. And, uh, but he's the one that brought in John Wesley when he had his Aldergate, Aldersgate experience, experience. And so he based, according to his writings, everything then, not just on the three, but experience. The danger of the experience which is very is usually emotional I mean in 1979 is when I personally you know let the Lord be my Lord at a, at a religious meeting you know and I had a very emotional experience and my life's never been the same and a lot of you probably can share that um, the article Steve Pastor Steve I read from yours he's talking about when God got a hold of you at the age 17 and I, I know Ray has shared his. Don Holself was not with us tonight, but shared. Those are emotional experiences, as you said, Lloyd. But if we just base everything on emotions, on experience, it may not fit Scripture, tradition, and reason. You know, uh, some of the concepts that we've talked about uh, dealing with uh, morality or immorality, a lot of folks say that I just feel this way. So therefore, if I feel this way, it's got to be God, you know? And, and, and love as well. I feel, you know, if I, if I fall in love with my puppy dog and I go to the judge and I say, I want to marry my puppy dog <laughs> because I just feel this love, you know. I'm sure first, besides them locking me up, they're going to do a variety of things, you know. But again, just my experience. Well, how does that relate to scripture, tradition, and reason? 
And I, I know what you're saying that, you know, to try to think about it reasonably, but it, it has really helped me down through the ages from my experience to make sure that, it, that it's scriptural, you know, because there's a lot of weird emotions out there, weird experiences, but is it scriptural? You know, does it, does it fall within scripture? At least that's a help for me. Go ahead. Go ahead, say it again. The, the, the emotion uh, comes from interaction with the other three. Yes. I mean, I've, ne I've never had a situation where um, I've, I've just had an emotional response to nothing. Right. And, and um, you know, I give um, the times that we've had, that I've heard a, a, a wonderful sermon. Or, Very rare, isn't it? Or I'm sorry. a beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I think I've heard a couple in the last yeah. 10 years. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, but um, a wonderful religious concert. Yes. Um, the uh, uh, walk to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about it that it's emotion that's built out of the background of the scripture tradition. Yes. So it's it's not like it's not there, but I have a little problem with reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something I'll have to work through. <laughs> I got you. Well, you know, I I for let me just tie that in uh, before we leave there. I think John, do you have your hand up? No. Okay. Um, I, you know, I kid y'all a lot, and I say this about that I have my fried day. You know, my emotions, I really love fried foods to the point it would make me sick. It has made me sick where I eat it all the time. Not just fried chicken, potato chips, French fry, anything that's fried, bacon. Honestly, it's anything that's fried. So I love that. And so the concept, if I just let my emotions take charge, why would I not? Why would I, you know, why not? You say, well, I'm going to have high cholesterol and die. Well, why do I care? I die a happy man. You know, I've died eating all my fried foods. But when I read the scriptures and I begin to reason the importance of trying your best to live a healthy lifestyle, you know, and that's why, you know, again, in the Methodist tradition, we, uh, the pastors at least, not pastors' families always, but pastors, you know, were advised to abstain from alcohol and tobacco. Well, in that process, it's for healthy reasons. But my emotion is I'd rather just enjoy, you know. But there's reasoning that it does, like you said, it ties together. It does to a degree. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Well, let me, let me raise another question here that I think you'll enjoy. Verse 23 through 29, I thought, and I've not seen this before either, you know, we've been comparing the last couple of weeks of uh, Paul and Moses, you know, the lawgiver of the Old Testament, and now, really, as we've said before, he wrote so much of the New Testament explaining the teachings of Christ uh, that we are followers of the Apostle Paul. So it is the new law that we are following. And if you'll look at it uh, in your handout there, it says, Lowered in a basket, according to verse 25, to get him out of there, who else was saved in a basket? Moses, you know. Look at the comparisons. Bad guy to begin with. You remember Moses was the... Uh, Egyptian ruler to some degree, and then he ends up killing uh, one of the fellows, you know, and then he's in trouble for that. He was the bad guy. Uh, an amazing conversion, the burning bush, knocked off his horse. Uh, and then I mentioned about the teaching, the Old Testament law and the New Testament concept. And let me just remind you of that. A couple of weeks back, we talked about, you know, where we are as, and I don't mean just Methodists, I mean as all churches following the apostle uh, Paul there's just so many things in the scriptures that uh, deal with that. Um, that just, you know, the idea of deacons, elders, the idea of women in the church, the idea of slavery, um, the idea of marriage, uh, the idea of, of removing someone from a congregation and shunning them. You remember we talked about that a couple of weeks back? I've done lost my list here. I was trying to find it. But I mean, all of those teachings, that's interpretations of the scriptures, and we follow them because they're in the New Testament and they're by Him. Can you think of any other comparisons tonight, just off the top of your head now, 
of Paul and Moses. Right there. Shirley, right behind you there, Fran. It's, I'm not talking about Moses, but uh -huh. that's not the first uh, example of escape from the basket. There's Rahab and the uh, oh, uh, spies. And, and they let them down. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten about that. Now, that's a good one, too. Y'all remind me, we want to debate that sometime, because when they called uh, that lady that saved, you remember the two uh, uh, guys hiding out? You remember the Jewish spies? Do you remember that? And when they were questioned, do you remember what she did? She lied. She lied. How dare God forgive a woman like that? Ooh, we'll have to debate that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting story. It is, it is, it is. Any other thoughts? No, any comparisons between, I haven't written down any more. I put, that's for you to fill in. Between Moses and Paul, think about it for a minute. Let's see, Moses had Aaron and Miriam. I don't think Paul had a brother and sister. Uh, Moses was married. I don't think, and John mentioned last week that it was Moses' wife that saved him. And he got us into talking about sex. And so, John, we're not going to go there tonight. So, um, uh, any compare? I see a hand, Sherry, in the back. I think this might qualify a little bit. Okay. Uh, Moses was a stutterer, and he had so that was like a thorn for him. And Ooh, Paul had a thorn. Thorn in the flesh. We don't know what Paul's was, but was. he had something, and Moses also had an affliction. Affliction. Okay. Cool. Cool. Irene, up front here, Fran, to the left. Or to your right, Irene? Well, two things. They both had an experience with a bright light. Oh, yes. So they were touched with that. The fire, exactly. Yeah. And um, they both did a 180-degree turn. Exactly, exactly. Total. Total turn, exactly. Anyone else? Any thoughts come to your mind? I bet there's others. I don't, and again, go back to what John and I are, are talking a while ago. I don't think that's by chance. I think there's a reason in these comparisons. Yes, Kevin. Wasn't, um, didn't Paul go away for like 40? Oh, Paul went away for his three years. It was yeah, a three-year three journey. But didn't they say he went away and studied for an extended period yes, of time? Yes, And didn't Moses and so did then Moses. have to go off? And he went into the, wilderness, into the they're, wilderness, and they're called wilderness experiences. Wilderness. That's exactly right. I love that. Excellent. I hadn't thought about that. Glenn, over in the far corner. Good old Georgia boy over there. <laughs> oh, and amen to the Georgia. Oh, my goodness. Yes, sir. Since he brought that up, I had a... a studied a teaching one or uh, listened to a teaching one time and there was speculation that it says in Galatians Paul said that he went into Arabia yes. and that's where he did his, his seminary. study <laughs> and there was speculation in that study that Mount Sinai uh -huh. was in Arabia oh well that's fascinating I'd have to look at a my geography. That's interesting. Moses, the Ten Commandments. Moses, the plagues. Moses dies. Paul, you know, we don't really have a historical account of his death, but I don't know. That's excellent. Any others? Well, I want to leave you with another one here. We're at seven, but I'm going to, I want to keep going. Just Let's hang on just for a few more minutes, okay? We don't have anything else going tonight. I have a meeting with Miss Sherry and Miss Rochelle, but uh, let's just, just stay with me for a few minutes if you don't mind. If you have to leave, go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, you're not going to heaven if you leave, but just, just stay here for a few minutes, if you will, for a moment here. Verse 30 and 31. My question is, what does it mean to live in the fear of the Lord? That is, look at that now. Um. Uh, I think that means something, and I want to be living in the fear of the Lord, okay? Anybody have a prophetic word there? When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace, it was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. 
It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. John? I, I think it means exactly what it says. What, what, how do, would you explain that? As, as we know fear. I okay. mean, he, this is the person who can send you to hell or send you to heaven. Okay, okay. Well, then what, what would be the purpose of putting that in the book for you and I to read today? Maybe just to remind us that that should be part of our, our understanding right. of, of, of Christianity, maybe? I mean, I'm just... The, what is it, the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the fear Lord? Fear of the Lord. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Come on up here. Got Ray and Dodd and Adele. I got a whole bunch of hands here in Lorna. Go ahead, Ray. I don't think it's a physical fear. I think it's a, a spiritual fear. If you uh, <clears throat> trespass against what he said, then right. the fear of, of the, the spirit leaving you. Exactly. And that spirit, when it leaves you, then you're on your own. Yes. And, well, you, have, that, and, and you have no, no, nowhere to fight back from. Okay, but so that, that's kind of what John is saying. Yeah. I mean, really, it's a separation from God, you know. Okay. Adele? I think I think in this case it may mean respect. Okay. It's just like with your parents, you you fear them, but it's it's in respect. You know they love you and you love them. But I mean, I, I know there's not a whole lot of that going on now as far as parents, but but <laughs> you know, in in the old days, you know, right, back in course, the day, of course, you know, respect and love went together. And I think the fear, respect, love are just like a triangle. Should all go together? It should go together. It should go together. Definitely, I like that. A front, uh, dot and then uh, Bev and then we'll go down this side and then we'll wrap it up for the night. Go ahead, Dot. When we're talking about Paul, I I think that he did live in fear and it wasn't That's just of point. the Lord. Gotta remember who the story's about. That's a good if point. If you look at Acts 22 that Stephen uh, related to a while ago, it says uh, when I relate when I returned to the t Jerusalem, I was praying at the temple. I fell under trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about right, me. Right. And then he said, Lord, these people uh, know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those other people. Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Right up front here, Bev, and then Steve, and I don't know, Lorna, did I see your hand? I mean. <laughs> Bev, go ahead. Well, if you read the whole verse, you know what comes before and after. I think. Oh, that's settles, important. The that's context. very important. That's the context. You help us out, it Bev. It says, meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, Samaria had peace and was built up. And then living in, I think it's because living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So my interpretation is living in the fear, the respect, love, adoration, and all of that good stuff. They had peace. Okay. And then they had comfort of the Holy Spirit. Good. Because they were doing the Lord's will. Okay. Okay. And loving him. Okay, exactly. Okay. I agree. I agree. Steve in the back and then over to Lloyd. I relate that to Matthew ten twenty eight. Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, yeah. but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And I'm sure many of these Christians were terrorized when they heard the name the Apollo, or Paul or Saul. I mean, that man was something that would scare the living daylights out of Christians. Just hearing his name all of a sudden, they realized in a very stark way, wow, this man who was an enemy, yes, God changed him to become a Christian. Exactly. He's not our enemy anymore. And we were so afraid of him. And we didn't trust God because we thought this man was so powerful and so dangerous. And all of a sudden, God removed this terror from their lives, and they realized, remembering the words of Jesus, Exactly. Yeah. Oh, God like really that. is the one we should fear. Okay. Not man. Okay. I'm also looking at a verse. If you go to Lloyd over there, uh, you remember Ananias and Sapphira when they lied against the Holy Spirit? Uh, I'm, the last verse of that concept said that after they both fell down dead, it said great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I think that, was real fear. that real fear. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, Lloyd. <laughs> Lloyd, go ahead. Well, um, 
it occurred to me that uh, the, the history that everybody knew about was a god who uh, would strike fear into anybody. Hmm. And the introduction of the Holy Spirit uh, counteracted that and, and put God in a new light. Oh, wow. Well, that's in depth there, Lloyd. My goodness. I like that. Well, let's hold there, friend. We're already about eight after. Let me ask uh, for you to read ahead next week. Um, I, want us to, I want us to finish out the chapter, um, and then I want to go into chapter 10. But I, I really want you to look, if you don't mind, chapter 9, verse 40. It gives us uh, a formula uh, for Peter. We go back to Peter at the end of this chapter, bringing healing. Um, and I don't know if I'm pulling this out of the air, but uh, it, again, I'm going back. John, I keep picking on you, going back to the concept about why are certain things important. The way Peter heals at the end of chapter 9 says something to me. It appears that he prays, he finds God's will, and then he turns, it gives this appearance, to the girl that is ill, that has died, and doesn't then pray for God's will to be done, speaks to the issue, arise. It's like there's prayer and then speaking forth boldly whatever God has for you to do in life. In other words, spending all your time in prayer, but when the time of action comes, it's not like you're still over here, God, what is your will? What is your will? What is your will? It's, in other words, staying on your knees till you find out God's will being patient, which is so hard, and then when you know it, then you go after it, and that's what he seems to do. And if that's, if that's true, that should be the way we pray, but it also should be the way that we live our lives, you know? And if you say, well, I, Eddie, if it was that way, I'd, I'd spend my whole life on my knees. Well, maybe that's where God wants you to spend your whole life, you know, according to that passage. So if you could read that and then get your feeling, and let's open up with that next week, see if I'm just kind of pulling that out of the blue. And then we go into uh, Cornelius and his household being saved in the next chapter, chapter 10, and it deals with prejudice, uh, and it deals with, I think, what is sin and what's not sin. And remember again, we've lifted up before the three types of sins uh, in the Old Testament, ceremonial sins or ceremonial laws, dietary laws, and moral laws. And we seem to see one of those definitely defeated in chapter 10. And then you can find places for the other. But the moral laws seem to exist Old and New Testament. So that's all in chapter 10. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great discussion tonight. Thank you for all the folks volunteering, their insight, their wisdom. I truly believe, Lord, that's where the Holy Spirit speaks to us. I truly believe that, that as brothers and sisters share together, the Holy Spirit just takes charge. Even in a group this large, as we listen to one another, Lord, and as we pray together, and as we seek your face, and as we study these situations from long time ago, do they have an effect on us today? Do they guide us today? I mean, are, are we being directed by any of these stories today? Lord, we just pray for your wisdom, your insight, your direction, and may all of God's children say, Amen. Have a marvelous evening. Again, if you're coming tomorrow night, be sure and check with the front office, and we'll know what the storm's doing. <laughs>